Hey guys, it's Roderick. I'm here with Dark X-Men number five. So if you're new to this channel, this is where we review television, films, comic books, a little bit of reality television, but all wrapped up in a good key key. So let's get started. So this is our last issue of Dark X-Men number five. Um, if you've been watching our reviews of Dark X-Men, you know that every issue after issue number one has been more disappointing after more disappointing after more, has more disappointing. Um, after everyone, and I have to say, I'm just glad this whole run is over, right? I mean, this issue had so much potential, and they really just squandered a lot of the goodwill that people would have been more inner, would have been, would have had for these characters if they didn't squander it, right? And that's taking as someone who myself, I am not a Madeline Pryor fan. In fact, I have been very anti this kind of Madeline Pryor redemption arc that Marvel has been on with her because the fact of the matter is is that okay I get it like Madeline's a character who's like got a rad who got a bad deal in life but at some point my frustration of Madeline Pryor has always been she refuses to take responsibility for her actions right like everything that she is upset about are things that she did right so therefore what is she upset about why is she so mad she's just it's, it's, the character is just so frustrating and then on top of that marvel is kind of doing a very heavy retcon with madeline Pryor, right so if you go back and remember back in the inferno when madeline Pryor is is introduced and becomes the goblin queen right and we find out that Madeline Pryor is a clone of Jean Grey that was brought back to life by the Phoenix Force because Jean Grey rejected the Phoenix Force while she was underwater and the Phoenix Force needing some place to go goes into Madeline Pryor, okay? Now, we then find out later on in, the, in this past summer in Avengers versus X-Men versus Eternals, Mr. Sinister states that it was impossible to clone Jean Grey, that every every attempt that he made to, to to clone Jean Grey turned out to be something far more or less than what he was trying to make, right? Which leads us then to surmise that Madeline Pryor, in her state, when the Phoenix Force brought her back to life, was an imperfect clone, right? As we saw with Madeline Pryor in the previous times when she's come back to life, whether it's by Nate Gray or from another universe, she never had any real mutant abilities outside her master of being the Goblin Queen, right? But what Marvel's trying to do is trying to slow roll us on this venture that somehow Madeline Pryor now has mutant powers of telekinesis and telepathy, and it somehow has forced gumped her way into being in the same class of a mutant as Jean Grey, and that's just not even possible, right? And we'll get to how they try to try to slow roll us with that in this issue, but it just isn't really possible because it's been established that Madeline Pryor has no mutant powers, right? She was just brought by the back to life by the life force of the Phoenix Force. And if you read Louise Simonson's Jean Grey issue run, right, where they kind of still do another slow role with this Madeline Redemption thing, you still need to find out that all her powers are either coming from her as a Goblin Queen or by some alternate universe which she chooses to accept the Phoenix Force and then accept powers from other demons, right? So that's fine. Like that, you know, that is fine. But, you know, at the end of this episode, at the end of this comic book, really, there's a quote that the Goblin Queen says is, oh, Jean is true, is, you know, Jean was born to lead, I was born to suffer. Yes, life is full of pain, but suffering is by choice. And all Madeline Pryor does is chooses to suffer. And I just didn't, like, I felt that this issue was just a squander and a waste of what they could have done with the character to kind of like really buy us in with the character, right? Because if her whole vex and problem with life is that she was a clone who never really got a good shake in life, and I will admit, Scott did her dirty, right? Yes, Scott did her dirty. But the fact of the matter is, when you realize that you look like another husband's dead wife and the dead wife comes back, you should have been packing your shit a long time ago because you knew your time was up. You weren't offering it. How did you think that you could offer him anything other than what this woman he's loved his entire life to live anyway? It's like, I just feel like Madeline Pryor is just a poster girl for side chicks and their delusions. And I just get irked by that because if you're gonna be a side chick, recognize there's an expiration date on being a side chick. Now, you'll say, but she wasn't a side chick. She was the wife. Yeah, but she didn't stay the wife that long, right? Which makes her just a de facto side chick that he married and then went back to the original woman anyway, right? So anyway, 
that's my that that is kind of like my thoughts about Madeline Pryor. So let's get into the and let's get into the issue, right? Overall, this issue really didn't trip, just did not really give us no new ground, right? We start off with Madeline and the Goblet Queen. They're they're squared off, they're facing off, so the battle begins, right? So the goblin, so the goblin queen, who which is a imperfect clone of Madeline Pryor, right? Wants the mercy crown. She says that the Goblin Queen, the Goblin Queen, who can now somehow read minds, has read Madeline's mind to say that I know why you created this. You created this because once the X-Men decide to turn on you, then you can have this mercy crown and then you can get back at the X-Men. And I was like, really, chick? Like, like that that's that's what this whole thing is for? Mind you, Agent Kroll, who's one of the two Orcus contractors who dabble in the dark arts has created a bazooka with Elsie and he shoots it at Albert and then Albert then absorbs Elsie and then they kill Agent Kroll. Agent Kroll's dead, right? Meanwhile, Agent Valen is downstairs in the tunnels praying to some demon who she's traded her life for only to get phased into a wall and killed by Azel. So that's how our two, our, our two Orcus agents died or done. Okay. Now we get Implate, who's fighting the Nightcrawler demon monster, right? He's asking help for Azazel. Azazel's like, God helps those who helps himself. Implate's like, I'm tired of you. I'm tired of all this bullshit with this little deal we made. Tosses the monster over in the direction of Azazel. The monster then kills Azazel. Implate's like, you know what? I'm done. I ain't got to deal with Azazel anymore. I wasn't really seen, I wasn't really seen there for this whole like limbo X-Men shit anyway. And bye bye right? So then, meanwhile, the Goblin Queen is, has put on the Mercy Crown, and she's trying to entice Madeline on her side. She's like, I'm not really working for Orcus to destroy you. I think that both of us together can team up and really do a really great job of fucking over everybody else, right? And then Madeline's like, well, I don't think so, because every time I've always fucked up, and there are multiple times, you know, the X-Men have always taken me back, and that's not really you know, what I'm on right now or whatever. So then we get the really bad Jean Grey copy of Enough, right? If you remember from the Hellfire Gala, right, when right before Jean's about to really flip the script on everybody because she's tired of all this bullshit with people, she does this Enough and she suspends everybody in the air and then she's like, I'm about to change your mind and then we get this bullshit shit with Mora and then kills Jean Grey. They do the same thing in Dark X-Men, right? Literally with Madeline Pryor saying enough, suspending everybody with her telekinesis. I use that in air quotes because I guess she just found that at you know the Walmart or whatever. And she then comes into this discovery that, you know, I can write my own story. Carmen dresses up like an old Madeline Pryor to remind her that she can make whatever choice she wants to make. And then Madeline decides you know what, you're right, Carmen, and then cuts off the head of the Goblin Queen, and that's how the story ends, right? Okay, whatever. So then we get Carmen is introduced to Sink and the X-Men in the tunnels, and more monsters enter Limbo. Uh, mind you, Warren Skull is still underwater, and Plate is still sucking out people's souls, and I was like, how is this, uh, how is this the end, right? Like, there's no mention of Orcus. There's no mention of Scott. There's no plan of how they... So so what was this whole venture for, right? Madeline decides to create her own X-Men, right? To do what? To do what? So, so, so let's go back. When we came back in issue one, she's looking for the lost... Everyone, for some reason... They're looking for lost mutants for so you know to try to save them from Orcus. But I'm like, why are these people not trying to save the X-Men you have? Like one of the things, and I mentioned this in the videos for these last photo ones, the absence of Scott and Jean Grey just shows the whole back leadership vacuum that is missing with the X-Men. Because unless Scott and Jean are doing a handling shit, shit ain't getting done, right? It's just not really up to snuff. Because you can't tell me that the best plan you had was to go find some Morlocks in the ocean and chase after some chick in a mushroom village. And then now that that doesn't work, it's all over. Havoc ain't mentioned nothing about his brother, how he's on trial, how we gonna save him, what we gonna do. Ain't nobody thinking of linking up with the people in the tunnel, coming up with the plan. All of this for what? For what? I was just, I was just, anyway. So anyway, and at the end of this whole thing, Madeline comes in contact with another clone, an imperfect clone of herself, and the lesson she takes from this 
is that she gets to write her own path as opposed to maybe some empathy, maybe some understanding, maybe some, some compassion for Jean Grey, as you now know what it's like to be cloned without your will, to meet that clone in life, and to have that clone want to do bad things to you or towards the people you care about. We don't get that less of a Madeline Pryor. We get this faux, I get to write my own path, death dissipating in the background type of shit. And I was like, really? Right? So what I have surmised is that the, the purpose of Dark X-Men was not really about Madeline Pryor. The purpose of Dark X-Men was to kill Warren off. Right? So remember, as again, there will be three X-Men that we know are not going to survive in this next iteration. Warren is one of them, and Dark X-Men was the perfect vehicle with all of this Madeline whatever as a cover for them to kill off Warren. Why? We have no idea. Hopefully, we'll see why. But that's that's really the biggest development in Dark X-Men is that Warren is dead and nobody thought about Warren. We see nobody talk about how we're going to bring him back to life. Mind you, we can't bring him back to life because the five are in a white hot room. So there's no bringing Warren back to life. You can't, we can't even go get his remains. We don't see none of this happening. No kind of memorial, not a candle, not a feather on fire. Nothing for Warren. Warren's just gone, right? So anyway, that is Dark X-Men number five. Uh, stay tuned. I am going to do a kind of overview of all the all the Fall of X books, kind of more of kind of deep dive as to what I thought were some of the high points, some of the low points, and kind of where I think things are headed kind of in the future with the rise of the powers of X, fall of the house of X. But anyway, don't forget to like, don't forget to comment, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.